Hi. In this video, I'm going to read the first five paragraphs from the Einleitung, the introduction of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach's Versuch über die wahre Art das Klavier zu spielen. Here it goes. <laughs> Einleitung. Zur wahren Art, das Klavier zu spielen, gehören hauptsächlich drei Stücke, welche so genau miteinander verbunden sind, dass eines ohne das andere weder sein kann noch darf, nämlich die rechte Fingersetzung, die guten Manieren und der gute Vortrag. Da diese Stücke nicht allzu bekannt sind und folglich so oft da wieder gefehlt wurden, so hat man mehrenteils Klavierspiele gehört, welche nach einer abscheulichen Mühe endlich gelernt haben, verständigen Zuhörern das Klavier durch ihr Spielen ekelhaft zu machen. Man hat in ihren Spielen das runde, deutliche und natürliche vermisst. Hingegen, anstatt dessen lauter Gehacke, Poltern und Stolpern angetroffen. Indem alle anderen Instrumente haben singen gelernt, so ist bloß das Klavier hierinnen zurückgeblieben und hat, anstatt weniger unterhaltenen Noten, mit vielen bunten Figuren sich abgeben müssen. Der Gestalt, dass man schon angefangen hat zu glauben, es würde einem Angst, wenn man etwas Langsames oder Sangbares auf dem Klavier spielen soll. Man könne weder einen Ton an den anderen ziehen, noch einen Ton von dem anderen durch einen Stoß absondern. Man müsse dieses Instrument bloß als ein nötiges Übel zur Begleitung dulden. So ungegründet und widersprechend diese Beschuldigungen sind, so gewisse Zeichen sind sie doch der schlechten Art, das Klavier zu spielen. Ich weiß nicht, da man solcher Gestalt das Klavier für unsere heutige Musik sogar ungeschickt hält und manche dadurch abgeschreckt werden kann, solches zu erlernen, ob nicht selbst die Wissenschaft, welche schon jetzt so ziemlich rar zu werden anfängt, nicht noch mehr fallen würde, indem sie größtenteils durch große Klavierspieler auf uns gebracht worden ist. Außer den Fehlern, wieder oben angeführte drei Punkte, hat man den Skolaren eine falsche Haltung der Hände gewiesen. Wenigstens hat man ihnen solche nicht abgewöhnt. Dadurch ist ihnen folgens alle Möglichkeit abgeschnitten worden, etwas Gutes herauszubringen. Und man hat von den steifen und am Draht gezogenen Fingern schon auf das Übrige schließen können. Jeder Lehrmeister beinahe dringt seinen Schülern seine eigene Arbeiten auf, indem es heutzutage eine Schande zu sein scheint, nichts selber setzen zu können. Dahero werden den Lehrlingen andere gute Klaviersachen, woraus sie was lernen könnten, unter dem Vorwand, als ob sie zu alt oder zu schwer wären, vorenthalten. Besonders ist man durch ein übles Vorurteil wieder die französischen Klaviersachen eingenommen, welche doch alle Zeit eine gute Schule für Klavierspieler gewesen sind, indem diese Nation durch eine zusammenhängende und propere Spielart sich besonders vor anderen unterschieden hat. Alle nötigen Manieren sind ausdrücklich dabei gesetzt, die linke Hand ist nicht geschont und an Bindungen fehlt es nicht. Diese aber tragen zur Erlernung des wohl zusammenhängenden Vortrages das hauptsächlichste bei. Der Lehrmeister kann oft selbst nicht, nicht mehr als sein Machwerk spielen. Seine verwohnte und ungeschickte Maschine teilt seinen Gedanken das Steife mit. Er kann nichts anderes setzen, als was er bezwingen kann. Mancher wird für einen guten Klavierspieler gehalten ungeacht er kaum weiß, wie die Bindungen gespielt werden müssen. Folglich sehen wir daher eine große Menge elender Arbeiten für das Klavier und verdorbener Schüler entstehen. 
Man martyr den man fange dich gollaren mit abgeschmackten Murks und andern Gassenhauern, wobei die linke Hand bloß zum Poltern gebraucht und dadurch zu ihrem wahren Gebrauche auf immer und tüchtig gemacht wird, ungeacht sie vorzüglich auf eine vernünftige Art sollte geübt werden, indem es um so viel schwerer hält, dass sie mit der Rechten eine gleiche Geschicklichkeit erlangen kann, je mehr diese bei allen übrigen Handlungen ihre Dienste tun muss. So that was the first five paragraphs. And I was saying in, in my last video about the supposition I had that when you travel back in time, one of the biggest things you'd be struck by is how modern the people are. I've, I've heard that you know, there was a note in ancient Rome found where it, it, they said on it, I'll, I'll transfer the money onto your account at the end of the month. And then I, you know, heard on the Joe Rogan podcast, I forget the name of the scientist, but he was saying about how there was this ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics that they were able to translate. And what it was, was a, a letter of complaint saying they bought these goods that were faulty and they want their money back. You know, and that's, it's the exact same as what we'd write today, only we'd write it on email, but n n there's no difference. And I was saying that we have, you know, there tends to be this arrogance that because we were, we're, we're, f we're in the future, we're, we're born later, that we are automatically more sophisticated, more advanced than people in the past. And that our default setting is, is much higher than their default setting. And so it's very natural when you when you hear Bach talk about the players, the piano players, the way he is. It's natural then to imagine, you know, Neanderthals hitting away at a keyboard instrument with a stick in their caves. And, and that everything that, that, that Bach is saying there applies to, to a, a people that are much more primitive than we are. But when you, when you think about what's, what Bach is describing, you can start to see that he's not that he's describing as a society that is no different than as it was today. And if you think nowadays, what, what, what you could think distinguishes us is, is the internet and how connected we've become. And if we're all connected now, compared to then days where they weren't connected at all, where they were in their caves, hitting on keyboard instruments with their sticks. <clears throat> How could Bach know what the pupils were up to? And how could he know what the teachers were up to back then in 1750? when there was no internet, when nobody was connected. And how could it be that there was a trend among piano teachers? They were all doing the same thing. They were all composing their own material with which they taught. And it was considered then, according to Bach, that it, it was almost disgraceful not to do that. And how is that possible when they were not connected then days 
like we are nowadays. How is, it's the exact same as, as, as when you think of YouTube, everybody makes the same YouTube videos. And then a days everybody taught the same way. They all did it that way. And, and it, it, it was, cons you know, nobody entertained the, of the, the masses, entertained the possibility of using other good piano material like the French what the French um, piano players were providing and you can hear as well when when he describes what the you know that the the all that stuff is is withheld from the student under the pretense that it's too old and too difficult well, if you imagine a, a piano teacher talking then, saying, oh, th this is too difficult for you. Is that any different to what a piano teacher says nowadays when they say, you're, you're not ready for it. You're not ready for this, please. <clears throat> they won't teach it or they'll be reluctant to teach it because you're not ready for it. It sounds very similar. And when he, when he talks at the start of the second paragraph about how after a horrendous effort, the, the piano players um, managed to make the piano sound revolting to intelligent, sensible listeners. <clears throat> We're talking about a piano player who's playing who's performing in front of people. So we're not talking about some Neanderthal in a cage. We're talking about somebody who plays for people, who's prepared, who before that was nervous, who's put in a lot of work, a lot of preparation, who experienced the same nerves as somebody performing nowadays and, and, and is, who, who, who feels the same expectations that the audience has as an audience nowadays has when they sit and wait for a piano player to, to give their performance. So it's, it's the same. And he says as well that some of these teachers are considered good players. That's the same too. You know, in, in, in that video, episode six, The Golden Sound, where I read the first paragraph from the chapter about performance, he talks about fast players and treffers, and the treffers being those who hit the right notes. And he described them as, you know, they set the face in wonder, but they give the soul nothing to do. And, and the public taught a, a treffer, a person who hits all the right notes and plays fast is great. And that's no difference, difference than today. The public think as well those players are great who hit all the right notes and play fast. And so those teachers who will be considered good piano players, then a days, they will have those qualities. They will have the same qualities as teachers who are considered good piano players nowadays have. So when he talks about the audience or the public and what the public consider good or not, he is talking about an, a public that is the same as the public today. And I say this because the danger with looking at it through this arrogance and this natural arrogance, it's not like a, I'm not trying to insult here. It's, it's, it's natural 
it, it, it takes consideration to realize the, you know, we're no more advanced now than we were in ancient Rome or ancient Egypt, that the person themselves doesn't change, that the means to create the amenities that we enjoy, those needs we have have stayed the same and we find ways to f satisfy them. And the means we use to satisfy them change, but our behavior doesn't change. Ours stays the same. We, you know, we clap the same, we sing the same, we whistle the same. We do everything the same. We click our fingers the same, crack our knuckles the same. It, it doesn't change. And the danger is that when, if we think of the people Bach describing as primitive, banging away, having no clue, we degrade the level of sophistication Bach possesses and, and we, we, we underestimate the insight with which he is speaking. And then we think it doesn't, it's not relevant to us, it doesn't apply because he's talking to, to, you know, monkeys in a zoo with toy pianos, not to, an, uh, you know, an, an advanced race where if Bach was to see the virtuosos of today, the famous piano players, that his mind would be blown at how perfect they've become. Those players, fast, accurate players, existed then a days too. And they were known. People heard them. And there will have been as many then as there are now. So it's important to know that he is talking to you. And there's another thing. There's a, uh, uh, like a, an analogy that's, that exists. And I, I, I've seen this in places and in one of the places I saw it was in Anthony de Mello's book of awareness. And he talks about tasting and feeling the knowledge as opposed to just having the knowledge. And he, he likens it to a, seeing a, a signpost of, let's say, Paris. And if somebody goes and they're traveling to Paris, they think, I'm going to see Paris. And they arrive at the first signpost that says Paris. And they see that. And they go away. They, they, they go away thinking they've seen Paris. <clears throat> Whereas if somebody else goes to Paris, sees the signpost and continues past the signpost and then actually sees Paris, they'll go home too saying they've seen Paris. And with both people, you can see there's a world of difference between what the one person who believes they've seen Paris has seen and what the other person who's seen Paris has seen. It's, it's a massive difference. And that goes for, you know, that's an analogy for how we, we understand or how we recognize the words on a page. And with, with the words, with what Bach says, there is significance. And if you've listened to the words there and think, yeah, I've, I, I, you know, I've, now I know them, now I've heard them grand and move on and, and, and just check it off the list. Well, that's like seeing the, you know, the sign for Paris, but not having laid eyes upon the city. And and you can see the huge difference that 
to, to, to start discovering the significance of those words, that's when you start seeing the actual city. And, and it's the difference between those who have just read the words and not wondered about the significance of them compared to those who have discovered the significance of the words. And you can do that. I mean, the person who's just seen the sign of Paris comes back. If you, if you equate that to an education, they'll have gone to Paris. They'll have seen the, the, the sign for Paris. They'll go to Rome. They'll see the sign for Rome. They'll go to London. They'll see the sign for London. And that's like their education when, when they're not ever curious or, or recognizing the, the, the significance, the fact that the words have a, a greater significance to them. And if you call that person an idiot, they would say, excuse me, I beg to differ with you, but I've been to Paris, London and Rome. And they won't, they won't know that they've never actually seen any of it because all they have done in their education is read the words and uh, will have never explored or searched for the significance behind the words. And here you can, you know, when, when Bach says about the, the piano teacher, about those who are considered to be good players. And so those would be, you know, accurate and fast players. And, and you might see them on giving YouTube tutorials where, you know, they'll provide their exercises and everything, how to, how to play etudes fast, and, and they'll be playing all the notes fast. And Bach will be thinking of those people and he'll say they hardly know how to play the connections. And he stresses the connections. He says it as well that the French music doesn't lack connections. Well then, one should wonder what does he mean by connections? What does he mean? That he says connections because what's behind those connections is his insight. And he knows, and, and, and that, that, you know, the, the, the person on YouTube can think, can know, I don't, I don't know what Bach means by he doesn't know how to play the connections. And he knows there's a gap there that what, what is he talking about? And there should be a curiosity to find that out. As well, he says, um, when he said there about the piano not being left behind when it comes to learning to sing, and that it had to, has to settle for lots of colorful figures instead of fewer sustained notes, or that it would be a horror to have to, you know, um, draw one note from another or, you know, dis distinguish one note from another with an accent or a push. And then he called these accusations contradictory and unfounded. Well, what's contradictory about them? What's unfounded about them? What insight is, is Bach talking from when he says that? What does it mean? That, that, that's the significance of those words which you, one should be interested in discovering and curious about, knowing what does he mean by that? Or he says at the start, there's three things that belong to piano playing that are so, are, are, are linked together so 
precisely that one can neither be, that one without the other can neither be nor allowed nor permitted. What, what does he mean by that? What if, if they can neither be nor permit it? What does he mean if if they can't be if one can't be without the other? Well, then you don't. It does. It doesn't matter if they're permitted or not. You know, if if you don't need to forbid something that can't be, you you don't need to forbid teleportation because people can't teleport. So there's no need to forbid it. So when he says it can neither be nor permitted. What does he mean? Those, they're, they're all, all these sentences are alluding to the insight that Bach possessed. And when you look at the, the world he's, the people he's talking to, that they're no different, they're no less than we are today. You can see how relevant that insight is. And that, the, the, it's the contents of this book. When, when, when you know the contents of that book, those, the, the significance of those sentences he says there will become clear and you'll know. And that, that piano player who plays fast and, hardly knows you know who that the public like you thinks are good and Bach goes against public opinion and says they don't know how to play the Bindungen they'll want to know what Bach means by that so and that will When you know the contents of the book, you'll look back on that introduction and it'll, it's, it'll, it'll have the same difference as, you know, you could think of yourself as the person who sees the sign and thinks they've seen Paris. And if they go back to it, to the sign after seeing Paris, They'll, they'll know what it is, what goes on in their minds then when they see the sign, as opposed to what went through their minds when they thought that sign was Paris. Because what happens as well, when you see the sign and you don't see the city itself, and you believe you know it, just like with the words, you read the words but don't understand the significance, you won't have any curiosity about those words. You're not going to wonder. You'll 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 take Paris off your list, and you'll you'll never return because there's nothing there's nothing there to. You're missing the world behind those, behind that sign, and when as soon as you discover Paris, you'll realize there's so much to discover that you could never possibly know it. Whereas when you don't ever. recognize the significance of words you'll 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 walk around feeling educated yet and you'll have you'll have no curiosity as to <clears throat> return And there was something else there in the chapter three. You know, Bach says that um, that the pupils are are shown an incorrect position at a hand, and in that they're they're cut off from all possibility of doing something good. <clears throat> and that's like Bach is saying the same as what. 
what I said in the episode three video, where on the thumbnail I said, hands separately and hands together is a myth. And I talked about, you know, the, the hands being connected and that they're not at all separate and that when, when, when you're, you're playing like I've shown, that you can tap into this element that um, they'll always play exactly at the same time. That's most people are cut off from that realization, from that connection to that inner profound sense of rhythm. They're cut off from it. And that's exactly what Bach is saying. They're, they, 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 the way they're playing, if you're not, you know, if you play with curved fingers or flat fingers, you're cutting yourself off from producing something good. So, I would say, um, you know, check out those videos and try it. Because it's like what I said in the introduction, you have to, you have to think about, you have to be interested in yourself and think, what do I get out of this? And Bach said, you know, what, what, is, what is, is Bach providing in this book? And he talked about, in the, like I, I mentioned there, about the, the treffers and the fast players, how they set the face in wonder but give nothing for the soul to do. Well, if you... If you're thinking what what's in it for me those fast players accurate players who will gain lots of compliments and and, and praise not only do they not give the listener do they just set the face in wonder but give the the listener soul the the sensitive soul of the listener nothing to do they as well give their own soul nothing to do. It's, it's not given nourishment. And, and when your soul is given, isn't given any nourishment, you'll be left empty inside and you'll start to feel alienated. And, and feeding the soul sounds esoteric, but it is something real and it's like it's 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 the same as 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 feeding your belly you know you you eat some nice food and you're you're filling your belly and and it it feels good and and filling the soul is is similar it's like giving it that bit of nourishment and you feel filled up. And I think, and, and, that, and that exists in piano playing. And you can, a good example, I think, of, of that maybe you can relate to about what it's like to fill the soul that, you know, our connection to the planet and nature fills our soul. And so you could, think when uh, at some stage where you're out for a walk just outside and, and, you, and you saw something like a mountain or a scenery, something in nature and you know and you just you just felt good you know your your stress fell away, your problems seemed small and you kind of you just you felt contented, you didn't feel empty, you just felt satisfied and, and you'll go home feeling yeah that was nice 
Well, your, your soul was being given something to do, was being filled. And that's, that's kind of what it feels like. And so that's what Bach is offering. That's what I'm offering. And in and, 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 and behind those words, the significance of them is alluding to that. And, and that's what you want for yourself. The, the, the fast player, you know, not everybody will get popular or fa at the end of the day, you are going to want to play for yourself. And, and if, it's, if it's just fast, if it's just notes, you'll, you're not, your soul's not getting any nourishment. You'll feel empty. And you might as well be typing on a typewriter. And, and, and those exercises, all that mechanical stuff, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feed the soul. And, 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 and that's, if, if you take that on, if you emulate, strive for that, you're, you're doing yourself an injustice and you have to be selfish. You have to think that you, you want the best for you and you don't you don't want to settle so and that's why it's important as well to think to understand that Bach is talking about players who were in no in 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 no way inferior to players nowadays and that when he talks about the, you know, the hacking, the banging and the, the stulpering or the, the stumbling with piano. That, that you know, he, he's, he's more emphatic with those descriptions, but he could just, he could just as easily be talking about these arbitrary retardandos. Or crescendos that, that in players will add to music you know like in the second movement of the moonlight sonata there's that bit in the middle section that's tricky and you'll hear performers who add a, a retardando in there or in the first movement connecting the sections you'll hear You'll hear people adding crescendos and again retardandos that Beethoven didn't include. And, oh, and they might tell you that if, if that performer has integrity they will say they include that retardando and it's not because Beethoven is in his ignorance forgot to include the retardando 
or that, you know, the, the oh, just any of those excuses. They will say, we put, I put the ritardando in because I haven't figured out how to play it. And Bach will be referring to them. It, of course, he won't be so, so harsh. He won't say, you know, they're, they make this piano sound disgusting to his intelligent listeners because there's degrees you go. You can't cater for all levels, but he will, you could see that there's a chance he'd say, yeah, they don't know how to play the connections. That's why they add the ritardando. And so you can see at what level Bach can be referring to and how it is applicable and relevant to you, what he has to share. Because he speaks the truth. And the way Bach is describing the teachers, Chopin in a sketch for a message, message where he talks about the ingenious theories and that's 1830, 18, the 1840s. You know, that's 80, 90 years later. The pianos are so much more advanced then. But basically he's talking, he's describing the teachers and, and the ideas that are knocking about the same as Bach is describing them in 1750. And so why would teachers nowadays be any different? They didn't advance. They didn't advance. Bach went against popular opinion and Chopin would have g as well got, went against popular opinion because on a local level, these teachers would be considered, you know, people who know their stuff. On YouTube, they're considered people who know their stuff. In universities, they're considered people who know their stuff. So Bach and Chopin are going against that general consensus. And would they change their tune nowadays? Would they think, oh, um, now, now they're great. Now they've all figured it out. And I take back, I eat my words. No, they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't say, a, Bach wouldn't say a single thing differently. And we'd know, well, it's amazing. You'd think we'd know to listen to him, but it's, it's baffling. It's, it's, it's baffling that what he says get lost, gets lost. And the other stuff, those ingenious theories, the, the metronome ideas, all, all these all this nonsense, non-music acrobatics, that persists. And this stuff is rare as gold dust. It's, it boggles the mind. I'm really, I really, I can't understand it. I guess it's too good to share. It, it, that's what it is. It's, it's too good to share. And Buck was, it was incredibly generous that he shared that. He, he shared what it's like to be a Bach. And there's a chance that you will get to find that out when you get to know the contents of the book. Thanks. Bye.